So I've been to this hospital twice before, once when I was doing my MRCP exam in 1993 when I failed the first time, uh, and then the second time when my doctoral thesis was being examined in about 2000 when I passed. It's only the third time I've been here, but it's hopefully a bit more of a spirit of celebration today. I've not heard uh, all of the goings on this morning, but I was staying over in London last night, and at 3.50 in the morning, I got a daughter of a patient emailing me, and I just happened to be awake, so I just happened to write back, which probably surprised her. And I get a lot of people writing to me about their role as carers and about their parents, and she was a mental health nurse herself and knew her way around the system and was still battling and I won't do it today, but whenever I speak to audiences of health and care professionals who know the job, and I say, put your hands up, who has navigated the system for an ageing relative of their own? About half of them will always put their hand up. Every country have done it. And I say, hold on a minute, don't put your hands down yet. Keep them up if you've found it really difficult, despite the, work, the fact you know your way around the system and nobody ever puts their hands down. And so if it's difficult for professionals... You can imagine how difficult it is for other people. And I'm going to draw your attention. It's well worth looking these two reports up. Back in about 2009, before the National Dementia Strategy um, came out, there were two big reports about the care of people with dementia in hospital. They're still on the web. One was called Acute Awareness by the NHS Confederation, and one was called Counting the Cost of Care. Now, Acute Awareness surveyed over 1,000 nurses, 1,000 ward managers, you know, charge nurses, sisters, and about a 1,000 carers about what it was like for them. And I had some lovely, if disturbing, quotes, especially by someone called Anne Reid, who may even be in the audience, I don't know. And I'll just tell you what Anne said, because this is quite pertinent. She said, from her experience with both her mum and her dad being in hospital, uh, we should have more flexible visiting time so carers can help care for the patient, for example, by feeding them, involve carers in issues surrounding the care of patients, after all, the carers have been doing it for a long time, and so they're often the best source of information. And this goes beyond family members, for instance, care home staff. I mean, I look after sometimes adults with learning disability who are from hostels, and the carers know them very well. Have a dementia lead or specialist team. We can't expect all the hospital professionals to be specialists in dementia, uh, and we, they're often in, in for a different condition. Increase the level of dementia awareness amongst all of the staff. Um, and that was quite interesting. And in the... Counting the cost report as well, when they surveyed nurses and carers, one of the interesting things was that the issues that the nurses found most troublesome were actually the same issues that the carers themselves had concerns about. The nurses said, we feel ill-prepared and uncertain for some of the challenges, and the list the nurses came out with and the list the carers came out with were quite similar. Behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia, wandering, knowledge of the person as a person, which was illustrated by that story, and actually... I digress. There was a brilliant thing with Eleanor Oldroyd on Radio 5 called The Power of uh, Sport in Dementia. And they got people, some of you may have heard that, who suddenly, if they got... Uh, and there's Sporting Memories charity as well, where older men... Well, I know it's, it can be women as well, but it's often men reminiscing through football. People suddenly remembered how to play tennis, even though they've been inactive, you know. And so I think... Uh, but in the person as a person, capacity in decision-making, which is still a big issue, as we know, uh, nutrition... Staying too long in hospital. If you read the Health Watch England report called Safely Home, it's full of patient stories about either people feeling they left hospital in a rush or they were marooned. The stranded patient. I don't like bed blockers or bed blocking. They're stranded patients who are victims of the system. Continents, end-of-life care and decisions around end-of-life care. So that list was pretty much the same for both the nurses and uh, the carers, which is interesting. Now, how did I get involved with uh, John's campaign? I was a bit of a precocious child. I used to listen to the Today programme and read The Guardian and stuff when I was about 12 and uh, read William Keegan and stuff. So I've always read The Observer. It's always been my favourite paper. And Nicky wrote a piece about John in hospital uh, and his story. And, of course, I was thinking, as someone who's interested in whole systems of care, what on earth was Nicky's dad doing hospital at all for that long when he only had a leg ulcer? He could have been managed at home. Anyway, I contacted Nicky and we start, struck up a friendship and I know that lots of other professionals contacted Nikki, and I don't want to misquote her, but she said something like in her next column, uh, trying to do battle over this was like fighting with a wet paper bag. And the reason was because all of the professionals basically agreed with her, you see. She wasn't getting a lot of pushback about how very day. You, people were saying, we agree with you, and we've been doing this. And I managed to hopefully help Nick, Nikki and Julia get in contact with lots of other people already doing good stuff. I think that's right, isn't it? That was. We'll have to check the exact quote. Yeah. Um, 
so Nikki and I have been friends ever since, and I've helped, hopefully got her one or two platforms, got in contact with one or two people, got you on LBC and that kind of thing, didn't we? And, and then obviously Nikki realized there was a whole world of people who cared about this stuff, the Dementia Action Alliance, all the stuff in Scotland around all the people in acute care. Uh, and so I think you were pleased, weren't you, that there wasn't a them against us uh, thing. It was actually people did want to collaborate with you. And I think the other thing is, although, although Nikki's campaign was specifically around dementia, it's not just about people with dementia. There's lots of older people in hospital who are frail, who are... Well, you can argue about whether you like the word vulnerable or not. Some people have said don't use the word vulnerable. But frail older people with disability, with sensory impairment in hospital, it's a very common issue. The campaign's not just about highlighting problems and scandal-mongering, but celebrating good practice, which is important. And I think Nikki and Julia's positive attitude, and let's face it, Nikki's quite well-known writer, and I think the media profile has helped you get quicker traction than some people would have got, because you know how to get... PR and you might as well use it you know uh, so that's been fantastic and I think the certificate that people get on wards it's great when people get a kite mark or a certificate one of the good things I think to come out of the Francis report is that there's lots of public information now you go on a ward here's how many nurses we're supposed to have on shift today here's how many we've really got here's who they all are you know here's the complaints here's the verbal feedback but uh, alongside that here's the gifts and cards and donations and we do, in amongst all the misery, we do get invited to funerals sometimes of people who've died, or you know, we do get gifts and donations. And it's good to actually have that stuff about what's worked well as well as, well as what's gone badly. So it's not just about uh, frail people. I would say that we've got to think for a moment about what modern hospitals are like, though, OK? Because I qualified in 1989. Hospitals now are nothing like they were when I qualified, apart from there being a third fewer beds. They're largely about older people. There are lots of people who arrive in hospital beds for want of adequate social care provision, adequate primary care, and then who stay too long. But even if we did all those things right, people get sick and dementia travels with people. And if you think about it, about one in five of the population over 80 will have dementia and it comes into hospital with them. So some of it's about keeping people at home and getting them out sooner. But think about this. The average age of a patient admitted to hospital now is 68. A quarter of all the bed days were in people over 80. When the NHS was founded, just after the war, 48% of people died before they got to 65. So the NHS was designed around single organ conditions and younger people. It's only 12% now. and the, We're going to have, by 2030, the average 65-year-old will live to 88 if they're a man and 91 if they're a woman. Okay? So the core business of the modern hospital is older people. And another killer fact is that one in four beds in English hospitals have someone with dementia in that bed. Another one in four will have someone with delirium in the bed. And about 5% of the people who come in um, who stay for longer than three weeks account for 40% of all the bed days. Okay? So wherever you go in any hospital in the United Kingdom, you're going to see lots of people who are frail, lots of people with dementia. And we have to be age-proof and dementia-proof and carer-proof, if you like, fit for the people who actually use the services. A third of people in hospital right now in the UK are actually in the last year of their life, although they may not know it, OK? Half of the population who die, die in hospital, and it's not always a bad experience. There's something called the National Bereavement Survey that interviews 20,000 people every year, and most people, despite the doom and gloom, say they're satisfied or very satisfied with end-of-life care, wherever it is. And, and I have lots of people, I offer them the chance to go to a hospital, go home to die, and their carers actively choose for the person to stay put, and we're lucky because we've got good palliative care. But we have to gear hospitals up around those kind of people. Now, I know you've probably had something about carers today already. I've, I've been at other places this morning. But can I just reiterate, there are around about, depending on how you count it, six million people in the four nations who are carers for an ageing relative, for somebody over 65. 1.5 million of those people are over 65 themselves. A lot more men than you might think as well. The caricature is it's the daughter or the wife, but there's a lot of male carers. A lot of those carers are in poor health themselves. And what I'll often see is a couple a bit like Jack Spratt and his wife, you know, where one person's physically unwell uh, and the other person's quite physically fit but has <coughs> dementia. And there's codependency, and I often have two, a couple where they'll both come into hospital at the same time because one decompensates without the other. The caring causes physical and mental health problems for them. And despite the Care Act, which gives carers a statutory right to support, only 5% of carers receive any statutory support from social services, and social care budgets have been cut by about 30% since 2010. So most of these carers are doing battle on their own without formal support. They may get some support from voluntary agencies. Um, the carers know the person best. 
uh, their former lives, their medical history. They know what's gone wrong recently when they've been bounced, bouncing around between different services. They're obviously crucial partners in helping the person to get home and negotiating a safe discharge plan. But we have to, and this gets very difficult as a professional, think about the person, the patient first, but we do have to think about the health of the carer. Uh, and I've got one man, um, obviously I don't want to breach confidentiality, but I've got one man now who seems very amiable indeed, but whenever he goes home he assaults his wife and puts her life in danger and I can't let him go home because I have a duty of care to her as well. And these are wicked real problems we deal with. So just about the, the professional lens for a minute, seeing it from, from our, our point of view, how can we work with, uh, with carers? And I think the first thing is they're a great source of information. If we're starting to plan what happens when people leave hospital, we need to know about what, how things are at home, don't we, what they can usually do. They can be partners in decision-making, for instance, around how far we should go with, with treatment, when we should stop. They're sometimes the advocate. They may be a lasting power of attorney, but they're obviously sometimes the advocate for decision-making in so much as they want to be. Because quite a few people say, please don't put that on me, Dr. Oliver. I'd rather you decide, and that's fine too. Um, they, they need information and reassurance from us. And as a hospital doctor on a ward with open visiting, the biggest thing I see in carers is they want information, they want reassurance, they want someone to talk to. And I was telling someone the other day, most ward rounds now I get put on the phone three or four times. It reminds me of being a kid in Manchester, your grandma's on the phone, go and speak to her. You know, everyone, so will put my niece, I'm going to phone her up, and I get put on the phone, right? So a lot of it is us giving them information. Um, uh, and then obviously they can help us with care. Things like mealtimes, even the most caring, most compassionate, most patient nurse or healthcare assistant will not be as good at getting somebody to eat and drink as their own wife who's more invested in it. So long as, and I did write a piece in the BMJ about the Johns campaign, and I got some people saying, we don't want to feel obliged to come in and provide that care. We don't want to feel that unless we're there, it won't happen. And I see carers who are so exhausted, they're grateful that the person's in hospital, they're worried about them coming home and they're in need of a break. So we have to be careful, but if they want to assist, fine. So before I knew about Nicky Girard and the Johns campaign, we opened up my um, home ward for visitors, but we also did a whole load of work at the Royal Berkshire Hospital where I do my day job about dementia. We got the money to make all the wards dementia friendly, the lovely environment to work in now for us as well as the patients, special areas for carers including overnight stay. We got um, a multidisciplinary dementia group with a carers association with the Alzheimer's Society, local authority all on board from the outset information leaflets, the About Me booklet. We got a mental health liaison team to come and do loads of training for everyone from porters to security guards uh, and dementia champions. And we've got this thing now called the Care Crew who are activities coordinators who wear red shirts and they will come and do things like music or games or sit with people who are distressed. Uh, and we've spoken at many public meetings uh, about uh, dementia, which have gone down very well. Occasionally, I'll get attacked by someone who's not very happy with the care their mum or dad's got, and that's a bit difficult. But uh, And palliative care as well are very involved in this. One thing we did, there was open visiting. And some of you who are in the health service will know there's a big focus now on quality improvement, moving away from conventional medical research to pragmatic plan, do, study, act cycles in real time. And who actually started the open visit on my ward wasn't me, wasn't the nurses, it was the junior doctors, because they analysed and they found out that they were spending, just them, forget the OTs or anybody else, two and three quarter hours every day talking to people's families. And so how the experiment started was, if we open up the ward to visitors, will that go down? And they measured it, and way, way down because they talk to me in real time as I'm going around, and it takes me half an hour. I'm sorry, I'm not interested in going through lunch, it's much more important to speak to all the patients and their families, and if some of them are having a lunch tough, you've got to prioritise, you know. It takes me half an hour longer, but we get far, far less requests for communication in the afternoon because we've spoken to them in the morning. Um, phone calls have stopped. Requests for meetings have stopped. Complaints about lack of communication, you still get the odd one, but they've gone down about ninefold. And then, of course, we got the certificate from the Johns campaign, which Nikki is proudly displayed on our nursing station at the moment. Uh, how else has it helped? It helps us to plan and negotiate people, people going home. Because obviously you can say, as the daughter's there, we're thinking about your dad coming home in a couple of days. Do you think you might be able to pick him up? And she'll say, well, yeah, on a Thursday afternoon. Fine, we'll do that then. You know, We can get them involved early. Um, we can help to reassure them. There are an extra pair of eyes and ears. I don't think there's any question that because I'm trying to get around 28 people in three and a half hours, which is no mean feat when eight or nine of them are new, 
Often it will be the daughter or the wife, because all my patients are men, although sometimes I can't tell the daughter from the wife and I've put my foot in it. Um, uh, but they will flag things to me that I wouldn't have noticed, because I'm trying to crack on. Still hold our feet to the fire a bit about what about his swollen wrist, or what about this thing with his medication? And I wouldn't know unless they pointed it out. So an extra pair of eyes and ears, and they'll often look out for the other patients in the bay and say, well, that fella's about to fall, and can't try and get the nurse uh, involved. It's great for the MDT because the occupational therapist can kind of grab the daughter and have a chat in real time on the ward. She's going to speak to her anyway, so why not do it now? The other thing I think is important is if you have a relative who has hearing impairment or visual impairment or dementia, they might say when you come in in the afternoon, I've not had any lunch or I've not seen a physio, when actually they have. If the relatives are there, they can see it happening in real time, and that makes a big difference. It stops a lot of that miscommunication. So barriers, are there any downsides? Privacy and confidentiality are a big issue. I'm halfway through a war down, there's a family around the bed, I get roped into a chat, and then I don't like talking over people's heads unless, like they're not there, unless they say, that's okay, doctor, you can do that. But even if they say that's okay, all the other people in the bay are listening in, unless it's a side room. And that can impact on other patients in bays with big extended families because they're ill as well, and if you have lots of visitors there all day, so we've got to be a bit careful about that. There's lots of other very pressurised ward work to do. Discharging people is the biggest priority for any of us in hospital at the moment. And it can be hard if you have to have interruptions. I think a really important thing is I want to give equal attention to all the patients, whether they've got families or not, whether they've got carers or not. And if you're not careful, you can end up having your time dominated by the few people who've got people who want to chat. So you've got to be a bit careful about that. It does put 30 to 45 minutes on the ward round, but I say it's worth it because we care for people better and there's less follow up and I do answer emails and take phone calls and things from families uh, but there's a risk of because we are only human losing our temper with people sometimes and getting a bit short and getting a bit offhand with them and I don't mind admitting I did it yesterday on a ward where I've got a bloke who has got a load of resentments about how the hospital communicated with him at home when I wasn't looking after him and every time I go on the ward round he's got his notepad and he wants to go through it all again and I did say look I can't have time for this now you know, I'll go and talk to another patient. Can we talk about the here and now? We, but I've never, to be honest, had any complaints about being a bit direct with people because they realise we're human. But it, you, it's a risk if you're in a rush sometimes. Uh, we do, and this is really difficult, pick up physical and mental health problems in the carers. It often becomes apparent that the carer herself has some dementia, but she's not my patient, and how much can I get involved? Uh, or there's, I mean, if it's carer stress and they say I'm very stressed, we can deal with that. But what's difficult is when, for instance, they want to go and take 15 stone husband home and drag him in and out of bed with no hoist when it's really not safe. And some of the reason they want to do that is their own mental health problems. So that can be a, a tricky thing to handle. No easy solutions. Once in a while, uh, having too much care involvement can hinder rehabilitation because we're trying to get people to do more for themselves. And if you've got a family who are putting the fork of food into the mouth when they could do it themselves or assisting them with activities that we want to encourage them to do more of it can be a problem but I think the biggest thing is staff are under huge pressure there are 11,000 nursing vacancies four and a half thousand medical vacancies in the NHS wards for older people particularly often have big recruitment issues and there's huge system pressure around discharge and I think this is where things like the carer's passport comes in about it's a contract about here's what you can expect from us and in return Here's what we could expect from you, a bit like in the NHS constitution. So the final thing I'd say is I would never go back to not having fully open visiting, and nor would any of the, the ward team. I'm not bullying them. They all agree with this, honestly, because I told them. Um, but, um, but So our experience has been overwhelmingly positive, and I can't imagine going back to how things were. It also, by the way, people who come out with all this bring back matron, and, you know, uh, golden era of medicine and nursing thing. We had Nightingale wards with regimented visiting, quite depersonalised care, one hour. In fact, <laughs> I, was a bit, I was a bit annoyed the other day when a patient's son said to me, oh, you look like that doctor out of the doctor in the house movies. And I thought, oh, yeah, one of the young, handsome, slim ones. Said, no, Sir Lancelot Spratt. <laughs> so, um, but the fact is, it, there, wasn't a go <laughs> there wasn't actually this golden era uh, in reality. Um, and we can make care more personalised benefits clear. And if you're really interested, and you may have heard about this already, both Heart of England Foundation Trust in Birmingham and Nottingham University Hospitals Trust, and Liz is in the front row, wrote lovely blogs on the British Geriatric Society website about the benefits from them of doing this and why they too uh, wouldn't go back. And I think the more stories we've got about why you did it, 
how you did it, how you overcame the barriers and why it worked, the better. And I know you've hosted loads of those, so congratulations to Nikki and Julia, and they're, they're great people to talk to online. I enjoy their company. Thank you.